Thank you, Dr. Ensel. Um, welcome, everyone. I um, want to take you on a bit of a journey through some of the questions that we've asked over the last, uh, you know, I would say decade or so. Um, the title is Building Blocks of Knowledge. And what I'm going to be able to share with you is a little bit of our, a little bit of our research findings asking a question about how memories, episodic memories are formed and replayed. Um, and if we had more time, I would be able to go into how these individual building blocks, the memories are combined to build knowledge. Much unlike current times, if you think about times in the past, I didn't wanna assume that everyone's days are hectic given the pandemic, but we are all extremely busy in this life. It almost feels like endemic to modern life. Um, we barely have a moment to reflect on an experience as it flows past us. Um, but dating back to the Roman Empire, um, people have thought about this as well. So it isn't endemic only to modern life. And I wanted to just share a quote with you. Marcus Aurelius wrote, time is sort of a river of passing events and strong is its current, no sooner is a thing brought to sight than it is swept by and another takes its place. And this too will be swept away. So while experience feels much like a flowing river, um, when we try to look back on the past, it's more like a still pool. Reflecting backward doesn't have the same kind of motion energy, the same kind of detail. It's more like these still pools. And so this led us over a decade ago to ask this important question is what is an episode in memory? What are we recalling when we think about the past? How is ongoing experience segmented into what will be later episodic memories? And so we wanted to understand this transformation of experience into memory. The dominant paradigms in psychological research and neuroscientific research in the past had used single trials to understand memory. In other words, experimenters had created episodes for individuals to process and encode. But we wanted to ask, how do these episodes naturally form or emerge from our experiences in the world? One way that we uh, try to, to think about this is trying to understand the temporal organization of experience. So we operationalize this question in a different way. So we wanted to ask when are mnemonic links, so links between uh, representations, when are they formed across sequential representations such that they become integrated and represented as a unit? And I'm thinking of that unit as a memory. What, what makes a memory? And how is one memory separated from other uh, experiences that may happen on the same day or on the same vacation, for example? And there's uh, a tension or an interplay between the discretization of experience into separate memories, as well as wanting to integrate and have that flow in your memory experience to create more than a very still pool, something that maybe has more detail. So let's just take a, a, a baby example. So here's just a blue line to represent time passing and experiences that we have during the day. Um, and it's known that um, there are boundaries that occur in Dr. Those... Dabachi, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I think we had a technical glitch and we can't see your slides. Um, oh. I'm just going to see if you could try sharing those for everyone to see. Uh, so I, I'm sharing them. Let's see. Did you see them at all? No. Oh, you mm -hmm. haven't seen my slides at all. Uh oh. Right. Let me figure out how to fix that. Um, let me escape. I'm so sorry. You missed my river and everything. We're going to have to work on that. Okay. You painted a beautiful picture with your words. Can you see the river? Yes. Thank okay. you. Oh my gosh. Okay. So let's see. So here's my quote. Here's the river. Rapid. Here's memory. Very still. Um, what is an episode in episodic memory? We were here. Okay. So here is, thanks for that, sorry for the glitch. Imagine that experience is just this blue line and it's flowing over time. Um, our everyday experience is broken up by boundaries. I'll just use these B here. And those boundaries can be as simple as walking through a door, hanging up the phone. Uh, these are the, the boundaries between events. 
So boundaries alter processing away from integrating temporally. These are sort of results that we found and I'll share some data with you. Um, but what happens is that now this continuous experience becomes broken, broken up into more discrete events such that sequential representations become unitized into these discrete episodes. And now I can think of those as event one, let's say event two and event three. I woke up and had breakfast, my walk to work, and sitting down at my desk in the office and having my first meeting. And what we find is that information within these events is more tightly associated and integrated and remembered as occurring closer in time. So let's just share some of the data. We've been studying this for over a decade. I wanted to share some results that basically show that representations within events are more tightly linked than those that are encountered across event boundaries, such as getting up and walking outside. Um, and we've looked at this in many ways. We've, we've used um, many different behavioral measures and different imaging techniques, and it's extremely robust finding. And basically what we see is, for example, if we ask you to recall the next thing that happened um, in a story or in a series of pictures that we've shown you, your recall is always better within the event compared to across an event boundary. Um, here's another study where we saw that. Additionally, if we ask you to recreate the temporal order from memory of those experiences, your recency memory and temporal order memory is better um, within an event compared to across an event. And you can see that in these bars over here as well as over here. So your explicit access to memories, your objective memory is improved, as well as the subjective um, distance that you report. So we tend to remember events that happen across a boundary as being separated in time. So this, what seems continuous in experience and time is continuous becomes discontinuous in memory. Boundaries seem to tease apart memories and represent them separately. And even subconsciously, when we test priming and implicit memory processes, even when you're not actively recalling, we see that representations within events come back to, to mind. They're accessible, they're more accessible to you if we design experiments properly. So it's like they've been reactivated um, and that doesn't happen as much across um, a boundary. So all of these processes help to form integrated memories. Again, there's an interplay between temporal integration within events and then separation that is assisted or caused by these boundaries. Let's take a, you know, another kind of toy example that we can all relate to, and this relates to Dr. Simmons's walk in the park, perhaps. So imagine you're walking through the park, you're maybe having a conversation with a friend, um, and you are um, ongoing, you know, the walk is ongoing in the park and then you exit onto the New York City streets. You can consider this a boundary. Um, and the, within this, these events, there are many things that are happening, right? There's the conversation that you're having, there's the view that you have of the, of the trees, there's the skyline. Um, and the point I'm trying to make is, is there are lots of different representations that exist at different granularities. Like, um, there's high frequency information. Think of that as the conversation you're having or actions that you're taking. Then there's the spatial context, which is relatively stable through the park, but then there's a boundary before you hit the city. So there's spatial context. And then there's more continuous temporal context, which again, seems to just be flowing um, in time. And so in this work, what we've shown really um, is that the integration of sequential items is facilitated by a more stable context. Again, this is within events, you get better integration compared to across events. But we know that this example that I've given you and all the ex examples that I've given you have to do with the real world. And the stability that I'm talking about isn't just in the real world, this is stability in your own internal thought. Um, so when I write spatial context, yes, these are ways that as experimenters, we can manipulate boundaries, but what's really important is what's happening inside your own head. So we wanted to ask whether the stability of neural representations over time in different brain structures, we're particularly interested in the hippocampus because we know the hippocampus is a structure that's really important for memory formation. If temporal stability in patterns of activity are modulated by contextual boundaries and relate to temporal memory integration. 
So in this uh, foundational experiment, what we did is sort of recreate these high frequency objects, their objects and faces. They're novel on every trial. We presented these to participants who were in the scanner, lying down and looking at a screen. And with each high frequency item, these objects or faces is presented a scene. And across four trials, we might present the same scene to kind of mimic that walk through the park, that stability of context. Um, and in other quartets, we had a scene that was presented on two trials, but then switched to be a different scene. So in, these, in this example I'm giving you of eight trials, there are three boundaries, what I would consider. One is over here, and there's one over here, and then another one at the end. So this quartet represents the same context within an event, whereas this quartet in our operationalization represents encoding across context. And what we wanted to do was to measure the neural pattern similarity at the beginning and the end of each of these trials. Now, mind you, the same amount of time is passing um, to participate, the same amount of actual time is passing. And what we can do is we can look at the pattern of activity in the hippocampus and in other brain structures at the beginning and at the end of this sort of events that we have constructed. And we can compare to see whether there's more stability within the same context compared to across context. And here's some data. What I'm showing you here is a pattern similarity across time in the hippocampus. And what I'm, I'm grouping the trials based on participants' subjective reports of how close information was. So what we did is we presented them with the high frequency objects, an object and a face, and we asked them, how close together did these two things appear? We wanted to get a sense of how closely they remembered the information, whether they had unitized them into a single memory. And what we see in the hippocampus and in parts of visual cortex is that pattern stability in brain activity actually correlates with how closely we remember information to have been encountered. And interestingly, we saw different effects in the cortex and in the hippocampus, and I won't get into too many details, but one of the interesting um, tidbits that we saw in the hippocampus is that the stability, particularly across boundaries, seemed to be related to memory, as if your hippocampal activity was helping you to bridge the disruption or the boundary that was present. So we became really interested in this result. So let's try to zone in and look at what is happening at the boundary. Um, so far, I've talked about boundaries as being sort of bad for memory. They break up memory representations, and that is very true. But it, what we also see is that arousal is enhanced at boundaries. So in behavior, we see that memory for information encountered at the boundary, the minute you step on the sidewalk, is actually increased, while temporal integration is decreased. That's the data that I showed you previously. So there's sort of this, again, this trade-off between integration and separation that's happening at boundaries. Now in the brain, what we see is that there's an increase in hippocampal activity at the boundaries, as well as we have some evidence that what's happening at the boundaries is not just an increase in activity, but we actually are starting to see the replay of the prior event. So this is when the story got more interesting. Not only are boundaries pulling apart um, representations in memory, but your hippocampus is replaying that past event as if it's packaging it up to allow you to bridge the gaps or those boundaries later on. We also have looked at arousal by looking at pupil dilation. And what I'm showing you here is pupil dilation, sorry for the, the text here. Um, when you uh, are, are, this is actually an auditory experiment. So when you hear a boundary tone, you have an increase in pupil dilation compared to tones within the same event. Um, and here you can see across the whole experiment, you can see how pupil dilation just sort of nicely pops up. You can visually see where the boundaries were in this particular experiment. So this tells us indeed that hippocampal activity is increased as well as arousal. Um, and arousal might actually be mediating some of the replay. And so we're really interested in trying to further understand all of the mechanisms that are at play um, at boundaries to try to understand how we stitch together memories um, over time. I'm gonna show you a little bit of the data that led us to this conclusion. So again, using this park analogy, there's the, the moment you enter the park and then there are these high frequency events. You can break up this, this sort of film clip, let's say into seven parts, and then there's the boundary to 
as you shift towards the city streets. What we did in this study was use EEG and we looked slowly over time to see when we were able to see the replay or the reactivation of the prior event. And what's graphed here is an index of replay. That's the extent to which your brain is basically, you know, in, in reinstating a memory without you having to do it explicitly. And what we see, pay attention to the green line here, this is the one we're interested in, is that replay is relatively low and stable within the event. Um, you're not, you're integrating over time, but you're not replaying what just happened. And it looks like as soon as you shift to a boundary, the hippocampal activity increase and potentially mediated by the arousal of when we're aroused, our pupils dilate, might um, initiate a replay of that prior event. Um, and the reason we think it's replaying the plot prior event is in the neural data, there's greater similarity when you're on the city street, there's greater similarity in your brain patterns um, to the park event, even though you're looking at the city street. So it's not a perceptual similarity. You're replaying what you've just left behind. And across participants, so this is a little, so as you enter the city, you're replaying the past. And what we see across participants is that the extent to which people show replay of the prior event is correlated with how well they integrate across events. And that means how well they can remember, let's say their conversation that they were having as they were walking through the park and entered the city event. So this is a way that we can overcome this separation um, between these distinct memories. So what are the long-term consequences of the interplay between integration and separation? What I've talked about so far is how the brain might be supporting the formation of individual memories. And why is this important beyond the fact that I think this is super interesting and uh, looking at how experiences get transformed into memories. But it turns out that this little bit of replay that might be evoked at the boundary is gonna determine what gets replayed later on in the long-term, basically what becomes a memory. Um, and that's really important for education because what we want people to remember are the, um, the integrated details, temporal integration, what happened when and what does it mean? Um, and if these boundaries are, are placed in the wrong, um, if they're happening all the time, if our attention is divided, we may be in a more chaotic state and what might get replayed are just little snippets of that experience such that you might recognize the flowers, but you might not remember what happened before or after it. This is the kind of information that might get tested on a recognition memory test. Um, and contrast that with when you actually reactivate a full integrated memory, um, what you now are, what your brain might reply if this process is intact will be uh, a very vivid episodic memory about the entire conversation that was had. And this I think of as integrated memory, flexible episodic memory. And this is the kind of memory that would support recall. So if you want your students to be able to recall a concept and, and provide supporting arguments, this is the kind of memory that we're actually hoping to evoke in our students. So I'm not sure about time here, but um, this is the data. So I just showed you, I told you what the answer was and how we look at that in the brain is we used, we showed, so to give you an example of an event, um, Oh, my time is up. I just got, so I thought it was, I had an intuition that my temporal context was up. Um, but anyway, we had the, the we, we have empirical data while people were in scanners to show that what gets reinstated um, in this situation, the event here is a series of faces. Um, and if you just show people two of the faces, um, what we see in the brain data is that people are reinstating the entire context. So the event gets solidified and it travels together. Um, and of course, it's a good question what, ha what happens in a pandemic when we lose our boundaries. Instead of the example I gave you, our lives look a little bit more like this. Um, and we can talk about what the consequences of lacking this external context might be for our memories. So thank you. And sorry that I, I went over time. And of course, I want to thank all of the people who do the hard work in the lab.